Psalms 90.10 says this, The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it's soon cut off and we fly away. Verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And Father, as we look at your word this morning, it gives us an exhortation to redeem that time. Use that time wisely. Lord, I ask that our hearts would be open to hear what you want to say to us as a church and as people individually. And Lord, just have your way. Our hearts are just fresh and open before you to let the engrafted word have its way. And so give us strength, we pray, to carry out what we hear you say to us. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. We're going to be in Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 21. And a message titled, uh, Walking in Wisdom. If you don't have a Bible with you, I'd love to have you follow along by grabbing one of the ones underneath the seats there. Ephesians 5, we'll do half a dozen verses, picking up where we left off last week. I want to encourage you ladies, uh, Justin Alfred, who, if you ever go on Blue Letter Bible, I mentioned this one other time, is uh, the the voice you hear when he pronounces the names. He's a Cajun uh, guy from Louisiana who pronounces the Greek name, so that's a lot of fun right there. And in that... His wife is Janie Alfred, who is going to do the women's retreat. So I really want to encourage you gals for the women's retreat to sign up, to register. And if it's nothing you've ever done before, then let it be your first one. If it's something you've done before, let it be your next one. So pretty much if you're a woman, you're qualified. Another thing, guys, the men's breakfast is going to be over at the property. And if you're able to, we'll work around there. But it's going to be steak and eggs. And so... Well, maybe there's going to be more guys than usual. That's what we were hoping for. And so you can sign up for that as well. And we'll give you some good news. Unisource, who we know we've had this issue about trying to get three-phase power, and I'll make this quick. Uh, We're going to have some more detailed building updates soon. But it looks like they said it was 50000 to bring the power there, three-phase, so then we're talking single-phase because it would be cheaper and everything else. Well, now they're talking about they are going to bring the th- uh, three-phase to us, which will be better for us in the long run and everything, and having a, a tenth of the charge at the most. Uh, so if that happens, that's a, that's a good progressive thing, and it looks like it's going to happen. So that's just some of the updates. I'll give you real quick. As we look at Ephesians... 5, verse 15, first two words are, see then. So, it's connecting. It's not a therefore, which we're used to, but it's a see then. So, in light of that, do this. And in light of what? Well, I messaged the, titled the message to walk in wisdom. And it says here in verse 15, to walk circumspectly. And remember, as we've looked at the book uh, of Ephesians, that walk is a, a synonym, if you will, for your lifestyle. So chapters 1 through 3 tell us all about all that we have, the spiritual blessings and everything, the inheritance, how we're adopted, how we're accepted, how we're redeemed, everything that's true eternally, spiritually that we have there in verse chapters 1 through 3. And so that's the lecture, if you will. So the lecture, what we've learned, ought to show up in the lab, right? How it works out. What we believe affects our behavior. And so chapters 4 through 6 is the exhortation of how it works out in our life. And it's looked at in the word walk many times. So it says that we're saved by grace through faith that's not of ourself. And then also that we are God's poema in chapter 2. That means we're his poem, his workmanship, and that he has created good works for us to walk in them. That we'd have a lifestyle of having good works now. And then in 4.17, it tells us that we no longer walk the way we, the Gentiles used to walk and the way we used to walk. So there's a new lifestyle that we have there that's not like those who don't have an end to look forward to that's heaven. 
that don't know where they came from, that don't know about forgiveness of sins, that think it's just all for the Friday night or whatever. Then it tells us in Ephesians 2 to walk in love. And then last week we summed it up with walking in light. So all those things that we're called to do in Ephesians, now it says, now so then I walk circumspectly. Light helps you walk, doesn't it? It's a great saver of pinky toes many times, isn't it? In the middle of the night or something, to have a flashlight or a little night light or something so that you don't bump into something. It illuminates things so that we can see clearly. It's also great to get roaches to flee, right? If you bring in the light, it exposes things. It'll make things scurry away or darkness. Don't ever flip on a light switch when people are trying to do crack. They don't like it. They want it dark. And so don't be there when they're doing crack, in fact. I'm just saying. I don't know what I'm saying. It's going to be one of those days. All right. So in, li- in all of this, and now it's going to go to talk about in, in the following chapters, uh, the rest of this chapter in chapter 6. Now 6 gets into, well, 5, it'll go into uh, wives. And then husbands. So we'll get into the marriage relationship. And then it'll get in, in chapter 6, 1 through 4, it'll get into family relationships and dads and kids and honoring. And then it'll get into even our work relationships. See, it's all about relationships now coming forth. That's how we live out our lives in these relationships. And then it'll get to spiritual warfare in these relationships. Then it'll have some concluding remarks real quick. And so that's kind of how it plays out. And so we'll be looking at those relationships, but the first one we're going to look at is a primary relationship. It's our relationship with the Lord through the Holy Spirit, because that's going to affect all those other relationships, the husband, the wife, the, the marriage, the church body, all of that stuff. And so next week we'll be in 522, which is, uh, we're going to spend about eight, ten weeks maybe there, because it's such a wonderful verse. It's, wives, submit to your own husbands, it's to the Lord. And um, I just, I can... I just feel such an anointing when I preach it. It's just one of the best verses that you can find in the Bible, I think. Uh, Lisa's coming along quite nicely. Um, So, anyways, it gives us this word here in verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. So there's a way to walk that's wise, and there's a way that you don't want to walk, and that's foolish. That word circumspectly in the English comes from a Latin word, which means to circumvent, to go around, or circular, or any circumference, which is a 360-degree circle. And so one of the part of the word that we get is to, to it's two words there that we put together. It's to look around. To look around, to be aware, to know surroundings. And then spec, circumspectly, spec, we get the word spectacle from it. So to see what's going on, to be aware, right? Not to be clueless, walking in a fog, walking in a tunnel. That's what it speaks of. Now, it comes from a a Greek word um, that's akrobos. And that Greek word, it's 199 in your strongs. It speaks of, well, this, acrobatics. We get the English word. Now, those guys, do you think they walk carefully or not? <laughs> do you think they're aware of surround? Like if it's an outside one, if it's really windy, do you think they're just like, I'll just throw the line there and we'll just go for it, man. I don't care how tight it is, anything like that. You know what? Um, baby oil or powder on my feet really doesn't matter. No, there's a circumspect, there's a, a, an awareness. In, those words speak of to avoid harm, to look out for, for warnings, to... Uh, be cautious. That's the way we are to work. Now, we are to do that in our relationships. Relationships, you see throughout the Bible, from whether it was God created Adam and Eve and then went looking for them. Adam, where are you? And they sinned and there was separation and the redemption. Always just wanting this relationship with people. Jesus Christ makes a huge difference in our relationships with other people. But it's that primary relationship that's fundamental, that's foundational, that we have with the Holy Spirit that we'll look at in just a minute. Relationships, though. We live in a world that doesn't place a lot of priority on relationships many times. Doesn't want to work things out. Doesn't 
care that much about people. We have the carnally, people care more about things than they do people. Sometimes this guy, he had some great, seemingly from the outside, prestigious wise relationships with some very famous, very attractive females and everything else. Never marry. Who is this guy? He's a guy who loved money. It's Howard Hughes when he was young. Now, many of you probably maybe saw movies about him or anything, how he withdrew himself. He became such a recluse and a hermit, wanted nothing to do with people. And, I mean, had the long fingernails, they said, and everything else, lived on, took out a whole floor of his big Las Vegas casino and didn't have a, anybody in the floor beneath or the floor above for years and lived out the, his remaining days that way. When he died... You know, there was the scramble for the billions. He's on Time Magazine as this guy who had nothing in reality and left behind anything that was of any value. He had a business partner that seemingly was his best friend for a lot of years. And that guy, he, be, he had to dump because he thought it could make him more money to dump this guy who was his one true loyal friend. He, he died in such a sad way. And it's very true how important and how great in the richness you can have if you just have some wonderful relationships with other people. What Jesus said, what he said was in regards to stuff and things, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul, or what can he even exchange for his soul? So that relationship with the Holy Spirit, when we walk circumspectly as we walk through this world, what do we do? How does that look? What's a primary importance that we understand? Well, it's like the psalm that we open with. It says, to teach us to number our days. Verse 16 says, redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. The days are counterproductive to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ as the flow of the world goes. Redeeming that time. Using the time that we have wisely making every opportunity walking in wisdom of that it says in verse 17 therefore do not be unwise again contrasting not as a fool or not as unwise but understand what the will of the lord is the, the will of the lord has got to be primary important to a follower of jesus christ it has to be number one the will of the lord is something we want to know more of we sing it don't we i want to know you more so as we consider this thing, we have this admonition to walk wisely. It says in Proverbs this, discretion will preserve you, understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil. To use our time in a way that is wise. Guess there's something universal about all of us. And a much broader audience than us, every human on the planet, this thing that we have a, a gift of a commodity is time. We all get a certain amount of time. We don't know how much time we'll have. It says that we have, uh, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We have this gift of time. And so in this gift of time, it's limited. All we can do is use it up. We just know we're using it up. We know we have less time today than we had yesterday. We know that about time. We use expressions like, you know, I, gotta, I just got to find me some time. Anybody ever said that? I just got to borrow some, some time from here to put it over there. I got I to squeeze more time out of the day. But guess what? We can't do it. Everybody's got the same amount per day. <laughs> Everybody's got 168 hours in a week. Everybody's got 24 hours in a day. We don't have a an, uh, way to get more time. We can't steal any more time. You might feel like I'm wasting some of your time by talking about time this much. <laughs> I don't want to do that. So we have this thing called time, but you're not, you know what? I got to find more time you're not going to find it we know where it's all at <laughs> and it's all we got 
I'm running out of time. As you get older, you start feeling that way. <laughs> you start feeling like, I want to make my time count. I know things can change in just a moment. So as we look at that, we realize that people that realize that and they want the will of the Lord, well, they're going to use discretion. It says in Proverbs 15, 21, this, Folly is joy to him who is destitute of discernment, but a man of understanding walks uprightly. You ever had people that just said, I don't care. I'm just here to party. Man, that's just what I'm going to do. Friday night, uh, that's all it's about. Um, wow, whew, I know that was stupid crazy, huh? But I didn't get caught. Wow, what a great weekend. I know that, that I could have been, it could have worked out a whole different way and I could have had some consequences, but you know what? It was fun, so who cares? That's like a fool. There's no discernment there. It's folly, just being stupid. Let's get stupid. People say that. We're going to go out this weekend and get stupid. It's joy to them who's destitute of discernment. But a person of understanding, they walk uprightly. There's a certain way of their lifestyle that happens. And everything that we have to be cautious, even as believers who have a mindset that want to do the right thing, to, to wake up, like it said in verse 14, and be aware that uh, there's distractions. Distractions everywhere. <laughs> Right? To take us away from our goal of what? Knowing the will of the Lord. What the Lord would have for us. And it's not here, the word chronos in the Greek, it's not just chronologically, speaking of a minute by minute, it's speaking of a word that's translated in Galatians as opportunity. It says, as far as we have opportunity. As Paul spoke of in Corinthians when he said, there's a door of opportunity open to me. It speaks of a season. There's a limited time and season, but there's no right. Timing is everything. You've heard that before. Timing when, because sometimes somebody's heart might be hard. You're sharing with them. You're praying for them. And then all of a sudden, man, there's a brokenness. There's a time where they're, they'll receive something about who Jesus is. Timing. It matters a bunch. Right? So let's use that wisely. Let's not neglect a season or an opportunity to serve the Lord, to share about the Lord, to get closer to the Lord. See, those things that are so important and essential, many times are what we neglect. I've heard it said so many times, I know I need to do this, but I just can't seem to get to it. And it's most often I hear it many times about spiritual things. I, I know, I, man, I know I need a fellowship, but I just, man, it's the hardest thing to get to. And we can get to all kinds of other things. I know I need to read in the morning, but man, I just get so busy and then my day gets away. I, I need to pray, but by the time I get to there at night, man, I'm just so burnt out and tired. I just, two minutes and I fall asleep. Anybody else relate? The time and do we believe Jesus Christ is the most important thing in the universe? The most important person. And our relationship with him is the most important thing, right? And yet, does everything in our lives reflect that? Oh, thank God for grace because we fall short in that so many times. But we need to understand how to use time wisely. I thought this was funny. Like, nobody in first service enjoyed it whatsoever. Um, do you know the, ain't nobody got time for that? I, I got a meme with her, defrosting. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> See, it's funny. I wish you guys could have told first service. Um, and here's the thing, though. I've done that. How stupid. I can't see hardly anything. I'm in tunnel vision. I got a little, but I'm like, I'm in a hurry. Now, if I get in a wreck, <laughs> that's going to take some time, isn't it? I'm going to have to fix the car. I could hurt somebody else. But I've done that, man. I've taken off with this. Okay, right there in front of me. That's all I need right now, right for the moment, right for what's in front of me. And it's like, I don't want to run my whole life that way. I've ran enough of my life that way. I've ran too much of my life that way. I still need grace every day for running my life that way. But then I can ask myself, you know, not only what, but who do I have time for? And with our kids now, like I said, Lisa 
got a little choked up recently when I kind of put it into words what had just happened that day when our youngest, Caleb, got his driver's license that after our oldest being 32. And so right away when you have a kid, you start carting them around. And so for the last 32 years, she's been part-time taxi driver. Both of us have, but her to a greater degree. And so that thing, I said, you know, you just got relieved of your job. And I'm like stoked because I'm like going, no more runs to the store for me for a while. Because kids love to run to the store when they first get their license. You got time for kids? I'm so thankful for the gals. Some of them, one, one of them that's teaching, two of them that's teaching right now. Man, they have taught for years and years and years. And they believe that they're going to get a reward, I know, of seeing some of those kids in heaven, of seeds they've planted, and, and everything else. And so... Matthew 19, 14 said, But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. How, how are we with kids? How are we with those that maybe don't have as much experience in life or with those that, that uh, might not have the, the intelligence quotient or perceived intelligence quotient? How are we with the simpler sometimes? Do we have time? Jesus, the disciples thought, you know what? He's a busy, important guy, and he won't have time for kids. And so they rebuked him. And Jesus then rebuked them and said, let the little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of God. Well, these are just some questions. What do I got time for? James tells me this, that pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Have you ever had time for a widow? Somebody needs your help. Have you ever done anything to help a widow? Have you ever visited an orphan? You know, what a pleasure it was. I've been to, and I, I'm grateful, and I feel I should be at more orphanages than, than anybody else that isn't in full-time ministry. I believe it should be part of somebody in full-time ministry, though, that they, they go on mission trips and they, they uh, visit orphanages. What a, what a joy it was from all the kids over the years since we've been Christians that we've sponsored, though, to actually sponsor some in Ensenada that, at uh, Horizonte that we were able to go and visit. Tell me, everyone that went on that trip with us and saw that the children personally that they sponsored, it impacted their hearts heavily. But these are the things that are spiritual. These are the things that are biblical. These are the things that we should have priorities for. I tell you, I've talked to a lot of people that I've said, hey, we got this opportunity. This is what the church is doing. And yet they've never taken, availed themselves that opportunity. And usually it is, well, when I get more time. Or I hope to next time. Go to Las Vegas to feed the homeless is one example. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. Isn't this what Jesus said? baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you, and lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. And that, where it says, go therefore, it's really as you are going. As you're going to your job, as you're going to whatever recreation, whatever we're doing, do we got time for people? Do we got time to share the good news of Jesus Christ? Do we got time to ever go on a mission trip? Do we got time to disciple people? Some of us have been walking with the Lord for a while. Some of you have been walking with the Lord, been born again for 15 years or more. Some of you. You have an opportunity as well as a responsibility to teach younger believers the things that Jesus Christ has shown you and that you know in the Bible. You guys are real quiet. You're going, you are beating us up, Ray. Time to get away. Who's ever said that? I need some time to get away. You know, Jesus understands that. Like I said in the last one, it's as you were going, but there's also a time when, when you get away. But it's not to get away to go to Las Vegas, <laughs> to party, to gamble, to go to some show you shouldn't go to, to go, you know, it, it's to allow you to get closer to the Lord. That should be part of your, I think, I believe, it is ours, vacation plan is I want to read sometimes some books that will draw me closer to the Lord. I want to hopefully have a little more time in prayer. All those things. Definitely not things that will 
bring me away from the Lord. And he said to them, Come aside to yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while, for there are many coming and going, and they do not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. So, maybe that's part of what's needed. For everything to grow out of our relationship with the Lord, it takes time, and we need to get alone with the Lord. Sometimes for an extended point, but, but every day there should be some time alone with the Lord. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Seizing the opportunity. Have you ever had people in your life that you go, you know what, I think they are more productive in their use of time than other people. Have you ever had people in your life that have inspired you kind of like that or encouraged you? You kind of didn't like them for their success for a little <laughs> bit and then you go, well, there's maybe something to learn there. So it goes on. It says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, and do not be drunk with wine. So, boom, big contrast. <laughs> so, using the time wisely, being a witness, glorifying the Lord, drawing closer to Jesus, as opposed to getting drunk. Don't be drunk with wine. And which is dissipation, that word means folly, emptiness, vanity, nothingness. But be filled with the Spirit. And that's passive there. It says, allow the Spirit to fill you up, be, to overflow you. So, how much drunkenness is okay? <laughs> how much carousing is too much? Any amount is too much. Now, I, I did a premarital just recently and had another one of those couples that were just like, they were good kids, man. They were just raised good kids, and they, they just didn't go off the deep end, so wild oats much, any of that. You know, they, they uh... so no matter what background you came from, I was an alcoholic from probably 12 years old when I first started drinking until I was 28 years old and I got saved. So I didn't get saved and stopped drinking until I was 28. So I've got like five years of sobriety. Uh, Amen. Or 26 or so. Uh, First Peter says this, For you have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Which is not an easy word to say. And it's not one to click over. Abominable bull idolatries. Things not to waste our time in. I've spent enough time. That's why I, I, I know I got so much time left. Well, I mean, I know I don't got nearly as much time left as I had when I first got saved. I don't know exactly how much, but I know. Like time, like sand in the hourglass, the days of our lives, right? <laughs> it's, 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 or it sticks if you want. Time is ticking away, ticking away. It's ticking away. I want to draw closer to the Lord. I want to, so that's what I have to ask myself when I'm spending my time. Back to verse 17. Is, is this your will, Lord? Is this your will for me to spend my time in this way? And obviously, it's not to get drunk. You know those books that say, eat this, not that. Well, I said, drink this, not that. Drink of the Spirit, not of getting drunk. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. People say, like I, I said before, let's go get stupid drunk. You never say, let's go get stupid filled with the Holy Spirit. You never go, let's go get smart drunk. Let's do you think smarter now that we're drunk. Let's, let's drive better now that we're intoxicated. And the Bible why I know it's clear that getting drunk is in contrast to having a drink. There's a freedom to discern whether you're in a category that can benefit from that. But for me, I cannot. 
I was rescued from that. It's one in, they say, 11,000 and something t- teenagers a day will take their first drink. They say one in 14 people to take a drink will become an alcoholic within 10 years. I wouldn't want to encourage something. I don't think my, we, Lisa and I have done our children a disservice by the fact that they've, we've got through life, we've had a good time, and they've never seen alcohol in our house. So I, I look at the statistics that 100,000 people, um, deaths that they directly relate to alcoholism, 25,000 of those are from drunk driving. And we do everything we can to get people not to drink and drive. You got half of the fatalities in fatal car wrecks are alcohol related. I, I never had anyone in my office saying, you know what, I just need to learn a little bit more about the liberty that I have in Christ and that I can drink a drink every now and then. But I've had tons of people say, how, how do you get free from alcohol? And you, you have enough, church, encouragement to drink. So today as I go through these verses, I stand on the other side of that and say, be cautious, be aware, be sensitive to weaker brethren and everything else when it comes to alcohol. Alcohol is a depressant, whereas really the Holy Spirit is a stimulant. Now, I'm not promoting stimulants in any way. (laughs) What I am saying is that the Holy Spirit can energize, he can uh, motivate, he can give peace, he can give all these things, and that we need to look first to him for that as opposed to anywhere else. And that I speak to myself when I think about the words comfort food as well. So it was good enough for Jesus something that we see here in this next verse. What is it? It's, so don't be drunk, it's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So the opposite, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Why did I say it's good enough for Jesus? He was there at the Last Supper where them crumb bums didn't even uh, want to wash each other's feet and he had to do it just prior to that. I mean, that's kind of a disappointing scene in some parts, isn't it? When you look at the Last Supper, it's great to see Jesus as a servant and everything else, but it's not, uh, it's not really so great to see um, them guys like fighting over who's going to be the greatest and they're just like acting like nobody's feet need washing and avoiding the elephant in the room and, and Jesus does that and then he's, he's got Judas betraying him he's just identified he's going out to the, the uh, garden of Gethsemane where they're going to fall asleep on him <laughs> instead of praying and then he's going to be crucified beaten, mocked, scourged, crucified What does he do when he goes out there? I don't think it's a coincidence that we have this little verse in Matthew. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. There's something that the Lord does to our souls that's just great through the, the power of singing songs, singing hymns, singing the, the words of God, um, singing to him. You notice there, it's kind of, there's both things going. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, giving each other a word. Who's been helped by a word from another Christian? And spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So there's, there's like, you're doing it to one another, but then also you're making, you got a melody in your heart. Spirit-filled life is one that's got a a joy and a melody in their heart. A spirit-filled life, we'll see, is a, is a humble life that submits. A spirit-filled life, verse 20, is a life that's a thankful life. Thankful, can recognize what's been given. This is what uh, Charles Hummel said about spending our time and everything else. The important task rarely must be done today or even this week, but the urgent task calls for instant action. The momentary appeal of these tasks seems irresistible and important, and they devour our energy. But in light of the time's perspective, the deceptive prominence fades. With a sense of loss, we recall the vital task we pushed aside. We realize we become slaves to the tyranny of the urgent. And that that book, Tyranny of the Urgent, is one I recommend. Um, Freedom from Tyranny of the Urgent. It's a booklet, Tyranny of the Urgent. I read early on in my walk. It was recommended to me by my pastor. And book I need to reread again as I got ready for this message. And then there's another book, Freedom 
from the tyranny of the urgent. There's another great book, Don't Waste Your Life, by uh, John Piper that I would recommend. There's a book I'm reading now. It's called Crazy Busy. Do you feel crazy busy? So what's important? What's eternal? Putting those things in a priority. And one thing I tell you that, that's great is to go ahead and sing. Our faith is a singing faith. To listen to music, to let it infuse our hearts and our head when we have anything that we might call dead time. To use that time to, to let it, uh, well, like it was for Saul, it would cause, calm him in his distressing spirit. So do this instead, he says, and giving thanks always for all things. For all things. Giving thanks. Looking at the bright side, many of you know Corey Tim Boom, her older uh, sister, Betsy. They were in a concentration camp in Ravensbrück, and uh, there in that Nazi concentration camp, they got put into another barrack, and the barrack was flea infested, and Corey Tim Boom was like super bummed out that it was flea infested and everything else, which makes sense. But then Betsy, her sister, said, yeah, but we can be thankful. You know what? Because the guards don't want to come in here. Because the guards will let us Bible study, let us do all kinds of stuff. We have a, a great freedom of not being oppressed by the guards because they don't want to come in where there's fleas. So she said, well, I thank God for the fleas. I don't know, man. That's, that's a high calling. I believe God brings people to things to give us an example. I'm not saying get fleas in your house to keep people away. That's for sure. But can we thank God? Can we say, let's say of our jobs, it could be worse, you know? 1 Peter 2.18 says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Could your job be worse? Oh, I think it could. It could be worse. There's a lot of jobs out there that could be worse. So it says to submit. Submit to one another in the fear of God. What that speaks of is the fact that we're all on the same team. Christians, we're not to be self-seeking. We're, we're not to, to be um, jealous when somebody else succeeds in something. We, we are to be submitted to one another, it says here. Because we answer ultimately to God. Every conversation we have, every way we treat people, we answer to God. It's the fear of the Lord. That it ought to be growing us. See, it ultimately comes down who we're going to listen to. And we get it in these next verses about submission and everything, in our workplace, and our. I'm, we need to submit to God. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. And the Spirit will bring that about in our lives. Have you ever seen people drink and get rowdy? Have you ever heard candy's dandy but liquor's quicker? Morals fade. Things pop out of people when they're... They say things they wouldn't normally say. They do things they normally wouldn't do. The Spirit entices us. One of the things towards caring about others. To not to have to fulfill our agenda all the time. I've never heard of somebody go, you know, they're a, they're a humble drunk. People get prideful sometimes. Well, I did. They were the best player in football all of a sudden when they were in high school, and you played ball with them, and you go, huh, you were second strength. They you, you get an imagination going. But the bottom line is, we're never too old to grow and to glow. His mercies are new every morning. I've made plenty of mistakes. I have, a, I have regrets of time spent in certain ways, even as a believer, for sure. But I go, I've got tomorrow, it looks like. I've got the rest of today. 
to move forward, to grow in the Lord, and to look more like Jesus. That's the glow part. I'm not talking about a, a UV tan uh, or a real one here. And to sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. I would recommend, everything's so easy to get now from the internet and everything else. Tyranny of the urgent. Don't waste your life, Piper. And uh, Crazy Busy, it's a, it's a new book that's out. And as I encourage you, let me tell you that I got the book Crazy Busy because my daughter sent it to me when I broke my foot. She goes, now you're not too crazy busy to read this book, basically. <laughs> and so I encourage you. I think you'll benefit. Hope I didn't waste your time today. Father, we... we uh, we know that when we read your scripture, there's something beneficial there. So I pray the wheat of whatever was in this message for each, each of us would uh, settle down in, in hearts. Lord, tweak us a little bit. Make us a little more like your son. Let the word have its way in our lives. And would you, Lord, fill us afresh again. Even as throughout the book of Acts, they were filled again with the Holy Spirit. They were overflowed again. They were saturated with the Holy Spirit once again. Lord, would you do that in our lives? Would you fill us up to overflowing to such a point where the things that would be unwise for us to walk in and to do would, uh, and it wouldn't have any eternal consequences would be less and less and your will for our life would be more and more. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Moody did an illustration where he had this glass. And he said, how can I get all the air out of here? And somebody suggested, well, take a vacuum and suck it out. He goes, if I do that, it'll just collapse the glass and just break it. You try to suck all the air out, you know. Glass isn't going to use like the vacuum cylinder. And so he, then he goes and he takes a picture, 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 a vessel of water, and he pours it in the other vessel. And he goes, now all the air's out. That the Holy Spirit would fill us in such a way that the, the junk and the empty space and the time waste and everything else, the air would go out that's we don't need. Amen. Amen.